A very warm good evening to one and all. Welcoming you all to yet another ISA National PG classes. Let's begin the session with the Saraswati Vandana to invoke the blessings of Lord God of Saraswati. On behalf of ISA, I once again welcome you all to the session and take immense pleasure be, to be uh, one of the coordinators for the evening. I am Dr. Muhammad Shahid Pasal, an alumni of Ames Jodhpur and currently working around Calicut. Now, I invite Dr. Honorary Hon Secretary of ISA, Dr. Sukhmita Bajwasa, for a few words. I think your record was playing in the background, Pasal. Okay, sir. Thank you, Dr. Puzzle. Actually, I was waiting for just no, it's fine, I think. Uh, thank you, Puzzle. I was waiting for Dr. JV Divate, our president, sir, also. He was to join, but I think we may join after a little while. So, uh, I think the class today is a very, very important. People may think what is the eye classes, uh, ophthalmic surgery, and where do the uh, these uh, complications come from. Like when I joined uh, anesthesiology in the first year, I think after three, four months, when I went to the ophthalmic OT, the people saying that we have to give this anesthesia, that anesthesia. I was saying, what is the need for anesthesia when you can give topical something, do all the surgery, something like that. And the real thing stuck to the mind when we saw a cardiac arrest in a patient of skin surgery. And that was a horrible scene for me. The first time I saw a cardiac arrest in a pediatric patient. Thereafter, I think the scenario changed, the, your mental you know, setup changed to read the anesthesia properly in ophthalmic surgery. There are many challenges, especially with the, so many of the comorbid patients coming for the cataract surgery. Suddenly, the ophthalmic assistant will be calling the anesthesia services. Majority of the time, they start the surgery without even anesthesiology, you know, and the theology by the side also. It, it is a common scene at many places. And when suddenly something happens, the local anesthetic reaction occurs, syncope or any, you know, the unconsciousness, something, and whatever complication comes, they're always being caught. So, ideally, how to set up the OTs, how to make the OT perfect, and how to reach and how to resuscitate in such scenario, it's very, very important. I think uh, we have got the best teachers and their best students to develop on these issues. And uh, without taking much time, I hand over the mic back to Dr. Fazal, who should start the proceedings from here. Yes, sir. We have uh, another coordinator position, uh, Dr. Gayatri Maji. Hello, everyone. Good evening, all. Uh, this is Dr. Gayatri, consultant anesthetist in Apollo Hospitals, Vaisak. And I'm here to introduce all moderators of today's session, Dr. Vandana Ma'am, Dr. Jigisha Badeka Ma'am, and Dr. Vinenda Oza Ma'am. Uh, Dr. Vandana Parmar Ma'am, currently uh, she's serving as professor and head, head of the Department of Anesthesia and PDU Medical College, Rajkot, uh, from 2012. She has wide experience of around 30 years. She had a PG in quality management and uh, accreditation of healthcare organization and also certificate course in disaster management. 
Uh, she also has more than 45 publications, presented lectures and invited as panelist judge in various conferences, awarded as best government critical care setup in COVID care. And her areas of interest are wide experience in all the fields of anesthesia and emergency patient care and ICU. Next, Dr. Uh, Jigisha Badeka, ma'am. Uh, currently, she is working as additional uh, professor in PDU Medical College, Rajkot. Uh, 27 years and also she is qualified ACLS and BLS instructor. Uh, she has PG certificate course in quality management and accreditation of healthcare organization by AHA and also disaster management course by IGNA. She had wide experience in all the fields of anesthesia. She did her observation, observership in bariatric anesthesia at Max Hospital Delhi and she had many publications in national and international journals, presented various lectures at various state, national and international conferences. Her areas of interest are bariatric anesthesia, obstetric anesthesia and labor analgesia. Uh, next, Dr. Vrinda Uzamam. Uh, currently, she is working as assistant professor in PDU Medical College, Rajkot. Her experience was around 16 years and she achieved gold medal in MD Anesthesia, received IMA National Award for Best Educational Activity, received IMA Gujarat State Board Award for Corona Warrior and she had pub more than 25 publications in state, national and international journals. Oxygen stewardship and cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Her areas of interest are regional anesthesia and airway. So we all uh, welcome uh, you all, ma'am. And before starting the session, I request all the audience to pl please mute their audios and keep your videos off during the talk to avoid interruptions. And if there are any questions, please type in the chat box. The questions will be addressed at the end of the session. Uh, ma'am, uh, over to moderators. Please, ma'am, introduce your uh, residence and start the session. Hello. Myself, Dr. Vandana. Uh, as a head of the department, I'm working with the Vino Medical College, Rajkot. Today, we decided to talk on the ophthalmic case surgeries. Generally, anesthesia management in any case scenario divides very compartments history taking, perioperative optimization, intraoperative management, plan of anesthesia, sudden change in the plan A to plan B, any mishaps occurs, management of that mishaps, comorbid diseases, and management of that comorbid diseases before starting any anesthesia, drug interactions of that uh, concerned disease and anesthesia drugs, and postoperative care, pain management, but today, considering the very short case of the ophthalmic surgeries, we focused only history part and uh, short history, positive history, and related management of the uh, concern of ophthalmic procedures. Uh, because the ophthalmic case surgeries are uh, only short case and in the exam. So we try to focus as a short case management only. Uh, let us... Uh, so introducing my other uh, coordinators, uh, Dr. Jigisha Badeka, Associate Professor, and Dr. Vrinda, uh, Assistant Professor. And today, to um, my third year residents, Dr. Aditya Singh and Dr. Tacey George will uh, present the two cases one by one, and we'll discuss on that basis. Uh, first case will be discussed by Dr. Aditya Singh. To hand over the case scenario to the Aditya Singh. I also thank Dr. Supinder Vajwa sir for giving such an opportunity uh, and a platform to PDU Medical College uh, to discuss the cases in the national platform. Thank you very much. Long live I said. Long live I said. Uh, before starting, ma'am, uh, just like to ask Dr. Divetya sir to say a few words. Is the our president IS is also there? Devitya, sir, can you unmute yourself? Okay, okay, sir, just wait. Yes, sir. Yeah, good evening, and uh, welcome once to one more of uh, this uh, excellent initiative of ISA, the PG classes. Uh, I don't want to take much time, I'm already interrupting the program. But I just want to wish you all the very best. This is a very important uh, topic starting from 
childhood right up to the geriatric age group of squint and uh, cataract so i think uh, both important cases both uh, especially in practicals and also probably in theory so very uh, useful information i'm sure will everyone will benefit from this especially the pg so please carry on and thank you very much for uh, dr parmar and her team from rajkot for uh, taking up this uh, program thank you dr vaj thank you sir thank you very much sir <clears throat> uh vandana ma'am please kindly go ahead no dr aditya singh will start discussing the case on the geriatric uh, anesthesia management in the geriatric patient with cataract surgery with comorbid condition of hypertension dr aditya singh yes ma'am uh, Good evening, one and all. I am Dr. Ajit, third year medical res resident doctor from Rajput, uh, presenting the case of cataract in geriatric patients under monitored anesthesia care. So, 68 year female laborer by occupation from Morbi presented with the following complaint of diminution of vision in a left eye since 10 months. Patient was apparently normal 10 months ago when she developed a diminution of vision in the left eye. it was insidious in onset gradually progressed to the current state diminution of vision was same for both near and distant vision with poor visibility at night it was not associated with a pain redness watering headache double vision colored halos or frequent change of glasses there is no history of ocular surgery trauma and use of eye drops patient is a known case of hypertension since 5 years and on tablet amlodipine 10 mg morning dose there is no history of diabetes mellitus asthma ischemic diseases tuberculosis stroke transient ischemic attack or chronic kidney diseases there is no history of any past hospital admission no history of altered mental status seizures shortness of breath edema edema headache dizziness or chest pain family history or surgical history was not significant personal history patient is receiving mixed diet predominantly vegetarian with normal appetite and regular bowel and bladder movements there is no history of any addiction general examination patient was examined under adequate light patient was well oriented to time place and person patient height was 144 cm weight was 48 kg with a bmi of 23.1 patient's nyha grade was grade 1 white at the time of examination temperature is 97 degree fahrenheit pulse rate is 78 beats per minute regular rhythm with normal volume and character of vessel all peripheral pulses were palpable bp was 130 70 mm of hg measured in a right arm in sitting position respiratory rate was 16 per minute there was no pain icterus cyanosis clubbing lymphadenopathy edema was noted airway examination mouth opening was three finger malam patti grade 2 thoracomental distance was 7 cm in oral cavity all teeth was intact there were no loose teeth or artificial dentures were present neck movement was adequate with no swelling over neck ocular examination head posture was straight and erect both sides of the facial symmetry is up in appearance ocular symmetry is symmetrical no horizontal or vertical gaze palsy no alteration in a pupil size and reactivity no abnormal eye movement noted no ptosis noted all the uh, systemic uh, examinations of the patient are under the normal limits a uh, summary a uh, 68 year old female a known case of the hypertension for 5 years taking tablet amlodipine 10 mg once a day presented with a left side diminution of vision uh, posted for the cataract surgery thank you aditya yes ma'am acha so your case is of a 68 years old female patient it's a geriatric patients and having a diminution of vision so what are the causes for that diminution of vision or the disease ma'am uh, diminution of vision can be classified into the sudden or the progressive uh, in the progressive uh, gradual ma'am with the uh, without painless causes of the gradual loss of vision it will be the pterygium senile cataract corneal dystrophy or age related macular degeneration along with retinopathy 
in the gradual pain painful causes of diminution of vision will be the chronic iridocyclitis or the corneal ulcer uh, when we comes to the acute uh, part of the sudden onset of the diminution of vision uh, sudden painful causes will be the acute congestive glaucoma acute iridocyclitis retrobulbar neuritis and in sudden painless it will be the uh, uh, vitreous hemorrhage or retinal detachment okay so your patient is of cataract and uh, patient age is 68 so uh, how do you define the geriatric patients according to the world health organization uh, any person who is more than or equal to the 65 years of the age is uh, known as a geriatric uh, uh, patients between the 65 to 74 year is known as a young old 75 to 84 is known as a medium old or more than equal to the 85 year is old is known as a oldest so what are the physiological changes uh, in geriatric patient and please tell the anesthetic implications for uh, the patient ah uh, ma'am uh, physiological changes in geriatric uh, when we start with the central nervous system there is the uh, cerebral atrophy there is a decrease in the cerebral blood flow Uh, along with uh, there is a decrease in the all types of neurotransmitters so there is increase in the threshold for all types of perception so because in the geriatric patient it is very common there is a delay in the reporting of the acute pain also uh, when we comes to the uh, in the cns changes post operatively uh, there is a chance of uh, post operative delirium or the cognitive disability in this geriatric patient coming to the cardiovascular system uh, there is a stiffening of the myocardium which causes the diastolic dysfunction or degree increase the filling pressure also there is the fibrosis of the conduction system which causes the arrhythmia in the uh, vascular system there is a stiffening of the vessels which causes the systolic hypertension or widens the pulse pressure in the respiratory system uh, there is a loss of the muscular support of the upper airway which causes uh, the uh, upper airway obstruction and also there is a decrease in the protective reflexes in the geriatric patient a uh, decrease in coughing reflex or swallowing reflex which makes them prone for the aspiration uh, also as the age increases there is a increase in the closing capacity and decrease in the functional residual capacity in these patients which makes them prone for the uh, ventilation or perfusion mismatch uh, when we comes to the uh, renal system uh, there is a decrease in the gfr in geriatric patient Uh, which causes uh, prolonged uh, clearance delay clearance of the drugs which prolong their clinical effects uh, in the hepatic system there is a decrease metabolism phase 1 metabolism of all the drugs uh, we are as in the gastric system there is a increase in the acid reflux or a decrease in the colon motility which makes them prone for the fecal impaction uh, in the musculoskeletal system there is a osteoporotic changes occurs Uh, which makes them very prone for the positional uh, fracture or the dislocation intraoperatively so padding is necessary in the hematological system there is the fibrosis of the bone marrow so anemia or immunosenescence is very common in the geriatric patients in the endocrine uh, changes there is a glucose intolerance occur as a result of which there is a impaired glucose homeostasis or a decrease secretion of the renin testosterone uh, or aldosterone uh, which altered the sodium homeostasis uh, uh, in the, these patients okay so we have to take care of all this uh, as a old uh, old age patient when it comes for surgery even if it is cataract surgery we have to take care of and we have to see the pre operative assessment so what are the comorbidities would you find in uh, patients uh, with geriatric old age Uh, ma'am in geriatric uh, the common comorbidity is started with the uh, cvs system there is hypertension arrhythmia myocardial infarction <clears throat> or peripheral vascular diseases can be seen in the cns there is a parkinson uh, alzheimer disease subdural hemorrhages are very common uh, in the renal system there is a ckd uh, is very common in respiratory system obstructive and restrictive diseases are very common Uh, in the musculoskeletal uh, skeletal system osteoporosis or osteoarthritis are very common uh, then in the psychological conditions uh, delirium or cognitive dysfunction de uh, depression is very common in the geriatric patients and uh, in the endocrinology there is a diabetes mellitus is very common in uh, geriatric patient thyroid disorders are very common 
diselectronemia malignancies uh, are very common in the geriatric patients as you suggested from the history the patient is hypertensive can you classify hypertension uh, ma'am uh, according to the joint national committee 2015 guideline uh, jnc 8 guideline any person who is having systolic blood pressure more than or equal to the 140 mm of hg or diastolic blood pressure more than or equal to the 80 mm of hg is known as the hypertensive and the optimal range of uh, blood pressure will be in systolic it will be less than 120 mm of hg and in diastolic less than 80 mm of hg So, how will you optimize this patient for cataract surgery? Uh, ma'am, this patient is known case of uh, hypertension. Uh, first, uh, I'll assess the cause or the severity of a uh, hypertension. I'll review the and uh, current uh, anti-hypertensive medication. Uh, is there any cause of the secondary hypertension or any suspicion for the major organ dysfunction in this patient? then i'll do the blood pressure charting and uh, assessment of the major cardiac complication with the help of the risk indexes uh, like the revised cardiac risk index uh, may be used then uh, uh, i'll continue the medication of antihypertensive medication on the day of surgery except the ace inhibitors and the arbs on the day of the surgery i assess the bp of the patient if the bp comes to be more than equal to the 180 by 110 along with the features of any target organ dysfunction or secondary hypertension so i'll uh, reexamine the patient and postpone the surgery but if the bp is less than 180 by 110 with no evidence of the target organ dysfunction or secondary hypertension uh, i'll continue go with this can you rule out the causes of secondary hypertension Ah uh, yes, ma'am. Ah, uh, the causes of the secondary hypertension it may the few chromocytoma, primary hyperaldosteronism, obstructive sleep apnea, ah, uh, chronic kidney diseases. Ah, uh, these are the common causes of the secondary hypertension. And what is the school of thought for uh, patient? If this patient is hypertensive, but hypertensive with diabetic and on AC inhibitors, would you like to discontinue on the day of the surgery, or would you like to continue? Ma'am, uh, ACE inhibitors uh, uh, can uh, lead to the uh, uh, hypotension. Uh, it can lead to the uh, on the day of the surgery if the patient is taking uh, ACE inhibitors, uh, it can lead to the hypotension. So I like to avoid the dose of the ACE inhibitors uh, on the day of the surgery. Okay. How will you uh, what are the different anesthesia uh, techniques you use for the cataract surgery? So, ma'am, uh, in this patient, uh, we used peribulbar block along with the monitored anesthesia care. Uh, the different techniques will include the ma'am regional techniques, uh, which consist of the different type of blocks along with the monitored anesthesia care. Uh, it may be the peribulbar block or a retrobulbar block along with the facial block. Uh, we may use the topical anesthesia or subtenone block, or we may use the general anesthesia along with the regional anesthesia or general anesthesia alone. So please tell me the what are the advantages of blocks and MAC over the GA. Ah, uh, ma'am, uh, the advantages of uh, monitored anesthesia along with the uh, block uh, as compared to GA will be the patient will be discharged on the same day. Ah, uh, the block will provide a good echinacea and the anesthesia. There is a minimal requirement of equipments or minimal alteration in the IOPs. Ah, uh, there is the decrease in the pulmonary and the myocardial complications which are present in the GA. Uh, in elderly there is a decrease embolic events or decrease cognitive dysfunctions which uh, are present in this year these complications will be decreased in the uh, mac along with the blocks so what do you mean by mac uh, so ma'am monitor anesthesia care ma'am it is a uh, anesthesia technique uh, in which we combine the local anesthesia along with the parenteral sedation or analgesia so it is a type of service which is provided by a trained anesthesiologist in which we uh, monitor the vital functions of the patient along with the early diagnosis and intervention and clinical problem or may give the analgesic anesthetic or sedatives or may converting into the general anesthesia if need arises so which drug you prefer to give Uh, ma'am, drug uh, which we use in the MAC, uh, we can use the benzodiazepine for the uh, decrease the sedation or the anxiety. 
uh, we can use the alpha 2 agonist as an anxiolytic sedative or the analgesic uh, we can be we can use ma'am uh, NSAIDs or uh, for the propofol or opiates we can also use so suppose you have given the propofol the patient is not uh, maintaining and patient uh, you have given the propofol and then uh, what are the uh, complications or what are the things you uh, face during the propofol induction or propofol solution Ma'am, propofol depresses the upper airway reflexes. Uh, these patients have the uh, decreased arm brain circulation time. So we have to titrate the propofol dose according to the hemodynamics on the uh, saturation of the patient. And if the patient is not maintaining the saturation, then uh, the uh, upper airway uh, devices, nasal airway can be inserted. Or we can provide the supplemental oxygen intraoperatively along with the uh, IV sedatives. Uh, so there is a decreased chance of the diffusion hypoxia in these patients. So you are using exomintromidine and uh, ketamine. Ketamine can be used? Uh, Ma'am, in these patients, I like to avoid ketamine because uh, it increases the IOP and uh, there is a nystagmus in the ketamine, uh, which can uh, uh, which can be a problem for the surgeon. So I avoid ketamine uh, in these surgeons. Will you preoperatively assess this patient? So, ma'am, uh, this is a geriatric uh, patient. My preoperative assessment, the first I uh, assess the patient's function uh, ability. So, first I assess the daily activities of the patient. Is there any history of the fall or the cardiopulmonary exercise testing of these patients? Or the patient is using any uh, functional aids like glasses, hearing aids, or sticks. Uh, followed by that, uh, I assess the any comorbid condition uh, of that patient or uh, uh, treatment for the same. Followed by this, I assess the medication history. Uh, these patients are uh, very prone for the polypharmacy, uh, which actually increases the drug interactions uh, in these patients. Uh, they also result in a drug toxicity or they also cause the many uh, geriatric syndromes like the cognitive dysfunction. So I also like to assess the polypharmacy in these patients. Uh, after that, I assess the uh, frailty and nutritional status. Uh, I'll assess the any there is unintentional weight loss or self-repeated exhaustion or low physical ability or low walking speed. Along with that, ma'am, I like to assess the mental status or the addiction of these patients. Uh, mental status can be uh, assessed by the abbreviative mental test score, decision making capability, communication, or addiction can be assessed with the help of the cage questionnaire. So what are the pre-medication you can use in this hypertensive patient? Um, uh, as a pre-medication, uh, uh, anticholinergics uh, uh, may be used because the geriatric patients, uh, their salivary glands are atrophied and also anticholinergics, they increases the heart rate and increases the myocardial oxygen demand. Uh, opioid pre-medication, I like to avoid or can only be used if the uh, condition or the procedure consists of severe pain. Antiemetics, I like to use S2 uh, blockers uh, because these patients are prone for the aspiration or a decrease of protective function. So uh, I like to use antiemetics. Benzodiazepine, uh, I may be used in the patient to decrease the anxiety along with the alpha-2 agonist can also be used uh, because it acts as an anxiolytic and sedative uh, along with the minimal respiratory depression. So which antiemetic would you prefer? Uh, 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 Renitidine can be used uh, in, in this patient. What about H3 antagonist? Ornensetron? Uh, Ornensetron can also be used, ma'am, but uh, 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 Ornensetron uh, side effect is that it causes QT prolongation. Uh, these patients are very prone for the arrhythmia. And so uh, uh, slowly uh, we can use them. There are two schools of thoughts in this. We come back to it. Uh, which benzodiazepine is preferred? Uh, Ma'am, uh, in this midazolam can be used uh, as a uh, anti anxiolytic as a pre medication. So, what is the advantage of midazolam over other benzodiazepines? Uh, Ma'am, uh, midazolam is short acting as compared to the diazepam, uh, as these patients having the uh, increased uh, brain arm circulation time. So, the peak effect of the drug will uh, present for a longer duration. So, there is a chance of the 
a sleep disordered breathing in this patient if we use a prolonged acting drug so short drugs will be preferred uh, as preferred as compared to the other benzodiazepines okay. What are the lab investigations you will carry out in this patient? Uh, Ma'am, lab investigation as this patient is a known case of hypertension, but its uh, hypertension is under the control. So I'll go for the routine investigations. I like to assess the CBC, uh, renal function test, and uh, maybe the coagulation profile because we are going to give the block. Man. So I'll assess the coagulation profile, uh, CXR, uh, chest X-ray, ECG, all these finding uh, investigation. Uh, all the routine investigations. So what are your intraoperative monitors you will be using for this patient? Uh, I'm, uh, I will, I'm going to monitor according to the minimum uh, monitoring standards. So there are the two standards. Uh, first is the, in this, according to the standard one, we monitor the patient uh, clinically and in the standard two, we monitor the oxygenation of the patient uh, and may provide the supplemental oxygen if the, uh, if it needs. We monitor the ventilation of the patient through the chest extrusion, auscultation of the breath sounds, or as we monitor the circulation with the help of the ECG, NIBP, pulse oximetry, or through the palpation of the pulses. Uh, we can only also monitor the temperature if the G is given, so we can monitor the temperature. So, Aditya, intraoperative and uh, postoperative, what are the concerns in geriatric patient? So, ma'am, uh, intraoperatively, ma'am, I'll use the drug. I will slowly give the drug because these patients, uh, according to the uh, uh, vitals of the patient, uh, because ma'am, these patients have uh, again the uh, increased arm brain circulation time and uh, increased uh, target organ sensitivity. Along with that, I use the shorter acting drugs. Uh, I'll maintain the normoxia, uh, normocarbia, and the normothermia intraoperatively. Uh, also, I'll use judicious fluid administration because these patients are very prone for the volume expansion. Uh, also, ma'am, I padded the pressure points to prevent the any joint dislocation or nerve compression. And if any sedation was given intraoperatively, I like to assess the sedation through the different sedation scales or the ability of the patient to follow the verbal commands. And uh, so, uh, what are the different blocks you use with the uh, mic? Um, blocks, uh, uh, we can use the ocular uh, blocks, ma'am. It can be broadly classified into the two types, ma'am. Uh, akinetic blocks and the non-akinetic blocks. Uh, in the akinetic blocks, it is the needle-based or the cannula-based. The needle-based will be the peribulbar block or the retrobulbar block, whereas the cannula-based block will be the subtenon block. In the non-akinetic, uh, there will be the uh, subconjunctival block or the topical anesthesia. Uh, these things are coming. So, how will you give the blocks? Um, uh, what are the this... techniques you use? Yes, ma'am. Uh, in this patient, ma'am, we give the peribulbar block. Uh, so, uh, the peribulbar block is a type of the uh, non, it is a akinetic block in which we are giving the drug into the extraconal compartment. Uh, so, uh, behind the eyeball, there is a cone which is made by the extraocular muscle base to which is formed uh, by the insertion of the muscles over the eyeball and the apex of the cone is directed inside the orbit. So in the peribulbar block, uh, after uh, explaining the patient to the block or taking the consent or taking the pre op vitals, we put the patient in a supine position, fixing the eye into the, pri uh, into the primary gauge and we give the block uh, in the lower orbital volume and lower orbital margin into the lateral one third and the medial two third. Uh, after that, two injections are using in the periorbital block, inferior injections and the medial injection. So the inferior injection is giving in the junction of the uh, lateral two third and the medial uh, lateral one third and medial two third, and medial injection will be the junction between the medial carenchal and medial canthus. After the block, uh, uh, the digital intermittent pressure will be applied, and akinesia will be assessed after the fifteen minutes. So you have given the peribulbar block. Why you are not preferring the retrobulbar block? What are the disadvantages of retrobulbar block? Uh, ma'am, uh, disadvantages of the retrobulbar block will be in the retrobulbar block, ma'am, we are giving the drug into the uh, intraconal compartment. 
so uh, there is the more chance of damage to the uh, important structures of the optic foramen there is a chance of the central retinal artery occlusion or inadvertent injection into the optic nerve or into the subarachnoid space or there is more chance of the uh, retrobulbar hemorrhage uh, there may be the chance of the globe perforation so all these chances are increased with the retrobulbar block which are now decreased with the modified peribulbar block so what is the modified peribulbar block uh, ma'am in the modified peribulbar block previously we are giving the two injections uh, another injection we are giving in the supero medial quadrant so it is a this quadrant consists of very less space so there is a chance of the globe injury but now we are giving the medial peribulbar block between the medial canthus and the medial carinca which decreases the chance of the uh, globe injury so uh, this is now the been modified peribulbar block we are using and uh, along with the blocks uh, peribulbar or retrobulbar uh, why we are giving the facial nerve block or how we will give the facial nerve block ma'am uh, facial nerve block mainly it will be given with the uh, along the retrobulbar block uh, because in the retrobulbar uh, uh, block we are giving the drug into the intraconal compartment so there is a nerve cranial nerve four trochlear nerve which supplies the superior oblique nerve it traverses the outside the cone so it is not blocked by the retro uh, bulbar block so additional facial nerve block will be given to block the uh, cranial nerve four or the orbicularis oris uh, muscle so there are the four types of the facial nerve uh, van lins obrand uh, nadbach or k at uh, okay so uh, what how will you give the van lin tick van lin block I mean the van lins block. We block the peripheral branches of the uh, facial nerve, uh, in which uh, we give the block at the lower outer margin of the lid, uh, uh, one centimeter from the orbital rim. Two to three mL will be sufficient. So, what are the other uh, drugs you use for the blocks? Um, uh, drugs uh, uh, we can use in the blocks, ma'am. Local anesthetic, uh, lignocaine, bupivacaine, uh, uh, lignocaine two percent, bupivacaine point five percent, or ropivacaine seven point zero point seven five percent can be used. Or the combination of lignocaine and bupivacaine can be used for the uh, prolonged surgeries. Uh, in the additives, uh, in this block, ma'am, in our patient we used hyaluronase, but along with the hyaluronase, we can use soda bicarb or epinephrine also. the disadvantage of hyaluronase in the mixture uh, ma'am hyaluronase uh, causes the liquefying of the interstitial tissue which allows the local anesthetic to penetrate the deeper but uh, it can cause the periorbital edema and may uh, cause anaphylaxis or allergic reactions right so we'll come to the intraocular pressure what is intraocular pressure and what are the factors affecting iop Uh, ma'am uh, intraocular pressure it is a pressure which is uh, uh, which is the uh, exerted by the intraocular contents to the layers of the eyeball uh, it it varies between the 10 to 20 mm of hg and uh, the factors affecting the intraocular pressure are the the factors which increases the intraocular pressure it may be the ocular condition like glaucoma or ciliary body tumor or the arterial pressure increase arterial pressure causing the increases choroidal blood flow which increases the iop or increases the episcleral venous pressure because of the straining or vomiting which uh, uh, eventually increases the iop or external compression during the mask ventilation or endotracheal intubation or intraop hypoxia or hypercarbia increases the iop or drugs ma'am uh, ketamine or scoline increase the iop uh, the factors which decreases the iop will be the decrease in the ep scleral venous pressure through the head up position or decrease in the arterial pressure less than 90 mm of hg systolic or uh, almost all anesthetic agent can uh, decrease the uh, propofol thiopentone uh, along with the volatile anesthetic no aditya aditya yes ma'am uh, before proceeding for the uh, of thelmic blocks what about comments on the drug sensitivity test are you doing drug, drug sensitivity test i uh, mean drug sensitivity uh, we are checking for the xylocaine uh, we checking the xylocaine uh, only the uh, sensitivity so each and every 
proceedings before any regional blocks, we have to first. Next slide. Aditya, about the MCQs. Yes, ma'am. So you got a few MCQs uh, regarding the uh, cataract in geriatric patient. Please answer them. It's open for the chat box. The correct statement, first uh, MCQ is for the correct statement. You can see in the diagram shown in the right side, A and B. First is A, subtenon block, B, peribulbal block. Second option, A, peribulbal block, B, subtenon block. Third option is A, retrobulbar, B, peribulbar. And fourth one is A, peribulbar and B, retrobulbar. Please put your answers in the chat box. Can we move to the second MCQ? The answer, ma'am. <laughs> answer is. Ma'am, we'll discuss the answer. Answer, answer. Have come. Answer is the fourth. A is peribulbar and B is the retrobulbar, the needle okay. placement. Fourth option. Hmm. Second MCQ. Moments later of block, apnea occurs followed by complete loss of consciousness. The most likely etiology to explain this event is first, intravenous injection of local anesthetic, second, subarachnoid injection of local anesthetic, third, oculocardiac reflex, and fourth, vertebrobasilar insufficiency. Chat box. Didn't see in the chat box. Eh? Chat box, there is mixed response. One, two, three, and four. <laughs> That's why we have kept it, ma'am. Yes. You got uh, them. Should we go for the correct, correct answer? Yes, yes. Any guesses? The maximum answers? Maximum answers are two, right? It's subarachnoid injection of local anesthetic. That's why it's apnea, then loss of consciousness. Can we move to the third MCQ? Yes. All are physiological changes in geriatric patients except first cerebral atrophy, second decreased filling pressure, third decreased GFR, and fourth increased closing capacity. Easy one. Four. Maximum is come at four. Yes. Chat no. box shows four from maximum people. Chat box shows four. Maximum people have said number four. Rescue. Aditya, what is the right answer? Aditya, what is the right answer? Yeah, it's the decreased filling pressure uh, in geriatric yes. patients because of the myocardial thickening. Uh, there is the diastolic dysfunction or increased filling pressure, not the decrease. So the right answer is uh, two. And the cerebral atrophy, decreased GFR, and increased closing capacity are the right answers. So Aditya, uh, uh, we have I think we have covered the uh, the questions regarding to geriatric and comorbidity IHD. Or uh, in uh, ophthalmic cataract surgery, patient comes with the diabetes or uh, patient is having a cough. Uh, how will you manage that patient? Or uh, uh, whether you postpone this patient or not? Or what are the treatment you give? Uh, Ma'am, uh, if the patient is uh, having a cough, or uh, I like to first uh, uh, evaluate that, uh, what is the reason of the cough uh, first, and I like to give a treatment, uh, uh, loosening uh, mucolytic therapy or bronchodilator therapy. Uh, 
uh, then uh, after that i like to go for the surgery uh, so now i think uh, we have covered the uh, maximum questions and if uh, any remaining questions you will ask in the chat box and now we'll move on the uh, second uh, uh, case scenario of a pediatric patient we'll move from pediat geriatric to pediatric so now i'll ask uh, tc george uh, she is a third year resident and she will present a case of a pediatric patient prostate for screen surgery Uh, good evening, all. My name is Jessie George. I'm a third-year resident in Pedio Medical College. Today, I'm going to present a case about anesthetic management of pediatric patient posted for cataract surgery. Uh, posted for twin surgery. Patient detail: three-year-old male child uh, residing at uh, Rajkot uh, with lower socio-economic status, coming with a chief complaint of uh, abdominal left eye movements since twelve months. Mother gave the history. Patient was apparently asymptomatic twelve months back. Developed inability to look towards medial side in the left eye, and mother also noticed the child is elevating his chin, which was intermittent and progressive in nature. No history of diminution of vision or color blindness. No history of head tilt, weakness, or drooping of eyelid. No history of any drug use. Past history: no history of ocular trauma, head injury. No history of fever, of upper respiratory tract infection. No history of vomiting, seizure. No history of cyanotic spell. No history of shortness of breath while feeding. No history of delayed developmental milestone. No history of past medical and surgical history. And in little history, first child of non consanguineous marriage. All trimesters were uneventful. Folic acid, iron tablet taken according to schedule. <clears throat> Regular antenatal visit was made. Birth history: birth was full term by normal vaginal hospital delivery. Cried immediately at birth. Birth weight is two point five kilograms. No history of asphyxia, jaundice, bruis, discoloration, seizure, or NICU admission. Immunization history: child immunized up to the age as per uh, national immunization schedule. Personal history: patient takes vegetarian diet. Uh, no history of bowel and bladder disturbance. No sleep disturbances. Family history: no hist similar complaints in the family. No other significant illness in the family. General examination: child is alert, conscious, and oriented to time, place, and person. Weight is twelve eleven kilograms. Height is ninety four centimeter. Pulse rate ninety eight per minute in right. Regular rhythm, normal volume. BP hundred by sixty mmHg. Measured in right arm in supine position. No pallor, no extras, cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy, edema. A febrile to touch. No evident limp or facial deformity seen. Airway assessment. Mouth opening is more than three finger. MPG class two. No restriction of neck movement seen. Physical examination. Both right eye and left eye is within normal limit except for the left eye. There be there is restricted medial movement of eye. Respiratory system examination: uh, trachea appears to be midline. Uh, bilateral chest rise is seen. Accessory muscles of respiration not used. Uh, palpation: tracheal position confirmed midline and auscultation bilateral air entry is equal. Parabdominal -para examination: inspection appears flat with central inverted amplicus, no scar, sinus pul pulsation, dilated veins were seen. Palpation: no tenderness, rigidity, guarding, no lump was appreciated. Percussion: tympanic note was heard. Auscultation: no bruit was heard. Bowel sounds were heard normally. Cardiovascular examination: uh, no invisible pulsation, dilated veins, scar, so sinus seen. Pericardium appears to be normal. Apex speed palpated in fourth intercostal speed. No heave or thrill. S1 S2 were heard. No murmur heard. Central nervous system examination. Patient is conscious, oriented to time, place, and person. Higher mental functions are intact. Sensory examination is normal. Motor power is equal in all the four limbs. Summary: It's a th three-year-old male child with intermittent strabismus in left eye, and uh, patient might have left medial rectus muscle palsy. Thank you, ma'am. So, Jesse, can you please define what is a uh, squint or strabismus, and what are the causes of squint or strabismus in a pediatric patient? Uh, trabismus is uh, misalignment of one eye, uh, mis misalignment of visual axis in one eye compared to the other eye. The causes are divided into two. It's congenital causes and acquired causes. Congenital causes mostly seen between zero to six months of age. The normal child which comes with an abnormal eye, mostly due to congenital cataract, associated with the other syndromes like Apert syndrome, Down syndrome, Marfan syndrome, developmental delay, and cerebral palsy. Uh, uh, acquired causes is this presentation of more than six months of age. Accommodative usually corrected by glasses. Ocular diseases like retinoblastoma, neurological uh, diseases like head trauma, space occupying lesion, infection, 
hydrocephalus and seizure disorders. A myopathies of ocular muscle cell thyroid disease and orbital disease and chronic progressive external ophthalmopathy. Which are the congenital syndromes uh, associated with strabismus? Congenital syndrome associated with first is Eppert syndrome is premature closure of uh, cranial nerves, otherwise called craniosynostosis. Uh, patient will have uh, uh, anesthetic implication as the patient have difficult intubation, possible coronal atresia and cervical spine fusion, and they'll have associated with uh, congenital heart disease. Another one is uh, Credochart syndrome. It is partial deletion of chromosome five. Uh, these babies will have micrognathia and hypotonia and congenital heart disease. Anesthetic implication, they'll have, uh, these babies are prone to hypothermia and they have difficult uh, intubation. Down syndrome, they have small mouth and mid-phase um, uh, anomalies, mid-phase mid, mid anomalies. These babies will have more airway obstruction, atlanta occipital joint instability and congenital heart disease. And golden ham syndrome is, again, uh, um, it, it, problem with the mandibular hyperplasia of one side of the face, these babies will have problem with mask ventilation, difficult intubation, and cervical spine abnormality. Turner syndrome, they have webbing of neck, though they have restricted neck movement, they again will have a difficulty with intubation. And last one is croissant syndrome. Uh, they have a prominent uh, forehead and a prominent eyes and narrow palate and cleft palate. Again, they will have a problem with intubation and possible elevated IC. What are the anesthetic concerns uh, needed in a strabismus correction surgery? Anesthetic concerns is uh, airway is remote and uh, uh, we have to give prolonged analgesia with minimal muscle relaxation and there'll be risk of malignant hyperthermia, there is risk of post-operative nausea vomiting and there is oculocardiac reflex and there is oculoemetic reflex and you should have a quiet emergence without coughing. So, the operative assessment, how will you assess this pediatric patient? First, um, I will assess the baby for any upper respiratory tract infection, um, and like fever, cough, cold, and nasal discharge, and other associated uh, myopathies, and history of any drug intake like ecothiophate. Ecothiophate is an irreversible cholinesterase inhibitor, will decrease plasma cholinesterase level. So, uh, um, uh, succinyl choline action will be prolonged in these babies. And uh, all routine investigation uh, uh, will be asked by... Uh, we, Suppose we your patient is having URTI, TC. Your patient is having URTI and uh, that is of mild variety. Would you like to go uh, immediately? Uh, would you like to uh, give anesthesia or you ask the patient to uh, take after sometimes? Since my surgery, strabismus surgery is not an emergency surgery, it's an elective surgery, and we are going for a general anesthesia with ET in situ. Um, I would uh, postpone the surgery for more than two weeks and re this uh, patient after two weeks. Okay. Uh, for how much, uh, how much time you give the patient uh, uh, after that you take? Two weeks or four weeks? Uh, more than two weeks, I reevaluate. It, it usually four to six weeks. Uh, the airway will be hyperreactive. So, so and uh, uh, how will you uh, premedicate this patient preoperatively assessment and premedication? First, I will take the inform and send, uh, ensure NPO status for clear fluids. It's uh, for two hours, breast milk for four hours, and uh, infant fluid, uh, infant formula, and non-human milk and light meal at six hours, and heavy meal is eight hours. And I'll secure an IV access. And uh, if the baby have a separation anxiety, I will go with an oral midazolam 0.3 to 0.5 milligram per kg. Or alternatively, I will use an IV midazolam 0.05 to 0.1 milligram per kg. And IV glycopyridate, 10 microgram per kg is given in a preoperative holding area. So intraoperatively, how will you uh, monitor these patients? Uh, I will take the baby in and attach uh, all the monitors according to the ASA standards like ECG, pulse oximetry, ETCO2, blood pressure, and uh, neuromuscular monitoring and temperature probe. Okay. Why neuromuscular monitoring you require? Um, Ba the um, babies are, uh, have immature neuromuscular junction. They're more sensitive to neuromuscular blockers. So which uh, muscle relaxant do you prefer? Uh, I will go with Vecuronium. Okay. I will 
the patient with choline and uh, maintenance will be the with So which induction agent will you use for it? Induction agent I would use is hyperpendone sodium, uh, 5 to 7 milligram per kg, uh, or propofol 2 to 5, 2 to 2.5 milligram per kg. So would you go for a, a endotracheal tube or with a supraglottic airway? Um, first, I pre-oxygenate the baby with 100% FiO2 five, uh, five, 3 to 5 minutes and an induction agent given uh, with hyperpendone sodium 3 to 7, 5 to 7 milligram per kg and injection vecuronium 0.1 milligram per kg and intubation done with cuff endotracheal tube with cuff pressure measured uh, and it is between 20 to 25 mmHg and analysis is maintained by uh, IV paracetamol 10 to 15 milligram per kg. In order to prevent post-operative nausea vomiting, I would give IV the exam at 0.1 to 0.2 milligram per kg. So you're avoiding uh, scolin. What is the uh, reason for it? Uh, sometimes the surgeons perform post-duction tests. Uh, it is uh, surgeons grab the sclera near the corneal limbus and uh, uh, and move the eye in all the eye field uh, in order to find out the which muscle is restrictive. So when scolene is used, it, in, it interferes with post-duction test. Uh, there will be prolonged depolarization of extraocular muscle for 20 minutes. So when your scolene is used, you have to let the surgeon know that you have paid for 20 minutes. So apart from uh, the interference of scolene with the post duction test, what is the other uh, interference it is doing? Uh, scolene itself causes? Increases IOP. Eight, uh, 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 6 to 8 mm, there will be increase in IOP. Okay, that would be a transient one. Would it uh, create any complications in further? That will, that will cause an ocular cardiac reflex tumor. Increase in intraocular pressure will trigger ocular cardiac reflex. Exactly. So how will you manage the airway? So you are going for a, a general anesthesia with the endotracheal intubation. Can you uh, give general anesthesia with a supraglottic airway device? Yes, we can give them. We can go with the supraglottic airway device too. Uh, but what we, are, what we are doing here is an endotracheal intubation. So what is the difference of pediatric airway than the adult? Uh, difference between pediatric airways, there is an anatomical difference and functional difference. Anatomical difference, the head of the baby will be larger when compared to adult. They are, they, there should not be a pillow needed. And there is tongue will be size, uh, tongue size is larger when compared to the oral cavity. Though there will be airway obstruction and there will be difficulty in intubation. Epiglottis is narrow, floppy and being a shape that is thinner in uh, adult hair. And it is difficult, in anesthetic implication is it's difficult to lift up with laryngoscope. Blade. Position of larynx is C, C3 to C4 in adult C5 to C6. Straight blade is uh, it's more needed than curved blade. Record is uh, funnel shaped in pediatrics. It is circular in um, adult mam. So cuff to tube can be used. It will provide perfect seal. And subglottic resistance can be felt when you are intubating the patient. Vocal cord is anteriorly slanting uh, and the uh, reepiglottic fold is thick. It is thinner in pediatric patients, so it is difficult to fix with the laryngoscopic labor. Functional differences, babies will have decreased uh, functional residual capacity and uh, decreased lung volume. They, they have uh, accelerated desaturation. Increased airway resistance, so we have to position the head carefully and minimize apparatus resistance. There is increased uh, dead space. So we have to use the circuit which have low dead space. Uh, probably we can use a uh, mask render uh, better soft, soft bars can be used. And then if increased basal metabolic rate, uh, mandatory adequate pre-oxygenation should be done. And increased closing volume, there is air trapping is more common. Less complaints and less of number of value. They have fixed tidal volume, so high respiratory rate should be maintained. And increased alveolar ventilation, they will come out, uh, they will have a rapid emergence from one entire anesthesia. So if patient is having some difficulty, so how will you go for the anesthetic management, airway management, difficult airway management? Um, I would go with an inhalation induction one rather than IV induction. Um, so which would, inhalation uh, you prefer? I would prefer the sevoflurane. Okay, why so? Why not uh, this Desflurane cause pungent smell. It will irritate the airway and it will trigger laryngospasm. 
what are the advantages uh, of uh, supraglottic airway if you are not using an ET in a difficult airway? How will you uh, pros and cons of supraglottic airway device with endotracheal? Yeah. Supraglottic airway device advantages is like we can uh, maintain the baby without the use of muscle para para relaxants. We can uh, maintain the baby in lighter pain of anesthesia and we ha can have a smooth uh, extubation that will prevent intraocular pressure, rise in intraocular pressure and ocular cardiac reflex. And then we can avoid hemodynamic changes that can occur during intubation. And disadvantages is like uh, there is increased risk of aspiration when you are using first generation uh, supraglottic airway device. And there is increased uh, dislodgement uh, intraoperatively because the surgeon is, is closely uh, uh, is close to the airway. And there is increased risk of ocular cardiac reflux because we are maintaining in lighter pain of anesthesia. But if we that, go with the DP2. Means... Yeah, carry on. Uh, if you're going with the ED2 advantages, we have less chance of dislodgement, less chance of aspiration. I think the, if the surgery is going for longer uh, duration, ET in situ will be the best thing, ma'am. And reliable ventilator monitor uh, with ET2. And disadvantages like uh, when you're intubating and doing a laryngoscopy, again, there will be increase in intraocular pressure and there will be risk of uh, laryngeal trauma and ischemia. So you'll be using uh, which generation of supraglottic device in case if you have to use it? Second generation. Okay, what are the advantages of second generation? It has a gastric channel and it has less risk of aspiration. <laughs> okay, so if you wish, if there is a difficult airway and if you have secured it with a supraglottic airway device, can you shift it to the endotracheal tube? Can you railroad? Yes. Can you yes, use the railroad technique? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay. With so you have got an added, added advantage of supraglottic airway device. Apart yes. from lighter planes, uh, if you have given, uh, there is a risk of OCR. So that is only one drawback. Uh, so endotracheal tube is a more secure way. So in case if you are going for a supraglottic airway device, you can always railroad and go for an ET tube later on. And which cough you use for endotracheal tube? Uh, micro cough uh, or routine cough? Routine tubes. cough. Routine cough. So, what is micro cuff tubes advantage? Uh, advantages is like it's a high pressure, low volume, uh, high pressure and low volume cuff. It doesn't have a Murphy side. It, the, the cuff is distally placed, and length of the tube is shorter. In pediatrics, the tracheal uh, length is four centimeter, and um, the the disadvantages is like it is have increased cost. Now. And it has a polyurethane thin uh, cuff. That will decrease such a channeling and aspiration, micro aspirations. Since long you are discussing about the OCR, OCR. So, what is that OCR? Uh, when there is excess manipulation of uh, extraocular muscle, there will be short and long ciliary uh, nerves, will, um, nerves will be activated. From there, uh, ciliary ganglion will be activated, then impulse is sent to trigeminal uh, um, nerve. From there to uh, gazillion ganglion, from there to uh, sensory nucleus of trigeminal nerve, from there to motor nucleus of vagus nerve, and, and vagus nerve carried impulse to the heart, and there will be bradycardia, um, uh, bradycardia, junctional rhythm, ectopic beats, and even a cardiac arrest. So, what are the risk factors for the OCR? Whenever they have ocular trauma, ocular uh, hematoma, there is increased manipulation of extraocular muscle pressure on the eye, eyeball and increased uh, intra, uh, increased pressure on the uh, orbital contents. Hypoxia and hypoventilation and hypercarbia will increase this uh, ocular cardiac complex. So intraoperatively, how will you diagnose that uh, patient is having OCR? There and how will you manage? There will be more than 20% <laughs> decrease in heart rate. Um, so only... And how will you manage that case, OCR? Uh, I will ask the surgeon to stop manipulating the extra uh, extraocular muscle. And if there is any traction applied to the extraocular muscle, I will ask the surgeon to release it. Uh, and then uh, and uh, correct the ventil uh, uh, manage the ventilation and deepen the plane of anesthesia. If these things are uh, not curing ocular cardiac reflex, and then I would go with anticholinus like IV atropine 0.02 milligram per kg or IV glycoparalyte 0.01 milligram per kg. So what are the other reflex related with the OCR? There is oculoemetic reflex and there is oculorespiratory reflex. 
and uh, uh, what other complications like malignant hyperthermia what is that and how will you diagnose Malignant hyperthermia is an autosomal dominant inherited uh, life-threatening disease which causes hypermetabolism and which, which lead to hyperthermia and severe acidosis. It is mostly seen in susceptible individuals with the scoline and volatile agents. Okay. So the risk factors for malignant hyperthermia? Risk factors there is neurological risk factors like uh, hypospoliated expectus excavatum, muscular dystrophies and strabismus and ptosis. And there are surgical risk factors like tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy, orthopedic surgeries, uh, ophthalmic surgeries, head and neck surgeries. And there is syndromes like uh, vision muscular dystrophy, Becker's dystrophy and body habitus like uh, short stature, bulky and muscle hypertrophy. All these are risk factors for the hyperthermia. We will you diagnose uh, it's a malignant hyperthermia? Intraoperatively, perioperatively, uh, patient will have uh, increased temperature, there will be muscle rigidity, and there will be hypercarbia. So, which are the agents you will avoid uh, in malignant hypothermia? Anesthetic agents? Uh, succinyl choline, I will avoid succinyl choline, uh, and I would avoid. Um, uh, um, Halothene, isoflurane, and fluorine. Uh, even sevoflurane and desflurane can cause malignant hyperthermia, but they are less potent. Uh, safely use uh, ketamine, propofol, uh, etomidate, yes, and all the narcotics. Okay. Yes. So, what is the treatment part of malignant hyperthermia? First thing is call for help, um, avoid all the anesthetic triggers and correct the hy uh, control hyperthermia, optimize ventilation um, and then the definitive ter therapy is dantrol and sodium. PC, how will you extubate this patient and uh, uh, what are the post-operative concerns for pediatric patients after extubation? Extubation should be smooth, ma'am, to avoid uh, increase in intraocular pressure and avoid ocular cardiac reflex. And uh, extubation is with IV neostigmine 0.05 to 0.06 milligram per kg, with IV glycoparallel 0.01 milligram per kg. Uh, and then, um, <clears throat> and uh, IV odensetron 0.1 milligram per kg before extubation to prevent post operative nausea vomiting. Okay, suppose post-operatively after extubation, patient has a spasm or patient is not taking uh, breath properly. So what is your diagnosis? How will you treat it? Well, when the patient is going to spasm, you have to think about laryngospasm and bronchospasm. Uh, laryngospasm patient will have uh, paradoxical chest movements. They will have um, um, uh, no, bad, bad, no bad movement, no, there is no ventilation. Uh, then we have to treat the pay. First, you have to give 100% O2 and with C, uh, CPAP uh, 10 to 15 uh, centimeter uh, wat water. And then you have to give uh, proper 4.5 milligram per kg. If that doesn't uh, solve the problem, when you have to give muscle relaxant and ventilate the patient. Now. If even that doesn't help you, then you have to go for reintubation. The patient. Okay. And what about the bronchospasm? Bronchospasm patient will have expiratory wheezing. Um, patient will have uh, tachypnea. Um, uh, we have to uh, give again 100% O2 and uh, short acting uh, salbutamol uh, and uh, steroids. Nebulization, you have to give? Nebulization, yes. Nebulization with the short acting beta agonist. So, Enagesia, uh, how will you give the Enagesia? I'll just say post operative. My concerns are like uh, post operative nausea vomiting and uh, pain management. Post operative nausea vomiting, we already give intraoperatively IV dexamethasone. And before extubation, we have given IV ortensetron. And we have to correct the fluid deficit. And uh, we have to uh, delay the injection of fluid until, the, until there is reduction in post operative nausea vomiting. And for pain, I will give IV paracetamol 10 to 15 milligram per kg or in a supposed tree form 30 to 40 milligram per kg. Jesse, we'll move on to the MCQs now. We have completed the case. 
Madhuri, ma'am, Ma can we move uh, on with the questioner? Yes, please, ma'am. Please. Okay, okay ma'am. Ma uh, the first ma queries were first query were ma'am patient. Uh, one of the uh, case scenario patient with ischemic heart disease who is on beta blockers and low heart rate. Can we use dexmedetomidine in this patients intraoperative? No, sir. No, 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 no. I actually patient or having a bradycardia patient. We are avoiding the dexmedetomidine. Pasaj, yes, Pasaj, yes, uh, we will just finish the MCQs and then yes, go on to the okay. uh, chat. Coming to the questions part, this yes. is, this is are just MCQ questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, first question: uh, Structures involved in efferent pathway of OCR: A. Ciliary ganglion, B. Motor nucleus of vagus nerve, C. Gazerian ganglion, D. Short and long ciliary nerves. The chat box is open. Please answer in them. There was no need to show the diagram in this. It is so clear from it. Maximum response is for B. Yes, ma'am. It's very right. We'll move on to the second question. Which block prevent efferent limb of um, buccal cardiac effects? A. Retrobulbar block, B. Peribulbar block, C. Subtenance block, and D. Subconjectival block. Mixed response from the audience? Yes. A, B, C. There's a mixed Everything response. <laughs> Only D. Whole syllabus is included. <laughs> Only D is included. So the correct answer is uh, K, right, Jesse? Yes, ma'am. Retrobulb block. It blocks the afferent link of the cardiac. We'll move on to the third question. Jesse, please narrate it. I'm not uh, getting five year old main shot, five year old main shot taken it for trabismus surgery. Suddenly he developed sinus bradycardia, intermittent ventricular escape beats, but but he is hemodynamically stable. What appropriate uh, treatment you will give for this arrhythmia? Tell the surgeon to stop pulling on the eye. Tell the surgeon to do a retrobulbar block. Change from halothane to sevoflurane. Decrease the depth of volatile anesthetic. Administer atropin. We can put F, do none of the above. <laughs> or all of the above. We want just the first step, what you want to do, actually. Maximum. A people have right. maximum right, 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 right. response. Yes, to stop pulling on the eye because the patient is hemodynamically stable at the same time. It's just uh, intermittent uh, VPCs uh, scenes still. Okay, madam, we have completed our MCQs. Okay, okay ma'am, uh, that was a very informative session, ma'am. Uh, now we have few queries, ma'am. Shall we? Shall I raise those? Yes, we have tried to. Uh, Compensate the answers in the chat box. Yes, ma'am. Most of them are clear. I hope it's justified. Ozal. Yes. Ozal, uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, let sir. me ask a question on this MCQ. If we ask the surgeon to stop pulling on the eye and uh, still the sinus bradycardia is there, uh, ventricle escape bits are there, what is next? Atropin. Administer atropin, sir. Just see, all the five or you want to add a new choice here. Sir, ophthalmic surgeons are very obedient surgeons. Once you tell them, no, even I before told, in the pre -op you, you told them, you told them, but even after the, they stop pulling on the so eye. The, the and the ventricle. With the ventricle escape. Bit. Actually, sir, A and E go together. Yeah. Somebody is there. A and E. Uh, I have not given that option. You have, to, you have to use these uh, C, D, E together. 
lower <laughs> concentration of sebo stop the in or they completely stop the uh, inhalation anesthetics and then you administer or propane so i think now it is we are not using allopen even we are using ah, sebo right. even if periphery yeah. are we are talking yeah. about our peripheral yeah yeah sir right so, so only one thing statement is tell the surgeon to do a retroverbal block mm. yeah that is not required <laughs> at this stage <laughs> yes the surgeon has to be competent to do immediately <laughs> and we can't risk it yeah that's why right. yes sir anyway fine yeah. good question yeah ma'am uh, now the queries were uh, first first one was patient with ischemic heart disease on beta blockers and having a lower heart rate uh, can we use trexamed on these patients and already uh, we discussed in the chat box that we will not use that as patient is having bradycardia so we will avoid the dexmedetomidine okay ma'am and then uh, other one was uh, is it compulsory to do coagulation profile in a case of regional anesthesia to be done at a regional anesthesia coagulation profile is not needed in every patient only patients with ihd or any cardiac instability patients or the stent or uh, history of uh, stent coronary stent in it uh, or some major coagulopathy is already uh, with patient or patient with antiplatelet right. so i don't think we don't need it in every uh, block patient of ophthalmology yeah. and one more question is it uh, must to check sensitivity test for xylocaine and bupivacaine or both and also do you routinely check sensitivity for hyaluronidase if they if you use as adjuvant so for for hyaluronidase we have never checked uh, in some cases uh, previous history of any local anesthesia sensitivity in a previous uh, uh, surgical procedure or, or a drug case. allergy we rule out it by our uh, dermat reference and uh, do the needful so we don't do it uh, routinely in all the patients xylocaine sensitivity test intradermal one one more question how to proceed for ga when we anticipate difficult intubation in pediatric patients exactly we came across in the supraglottic airway device along with the endotracheal tube so we have uh, if possible if there is a difficult airway already suspected like in pie robin syndrome or some other syndromes we would like to go for a supraglottic second generation supraglottic airway device insertion and railroad it with the endotracheal tube if needed mm -hmm. the awake intubation try uh, try for awake, awake intubation or inhalation with sebo tube now so can we use blocks along with general anesthesia in pediatric no uh, i i think pediatric patient uh, uh, will not use the block as uh, eyeball is not uh, develop uh, properly and uh, we can tell it so ga and with analgesic okay, so, we also have another question now uh, patient having an increased bp of 180 by 100 intra op suddenly and sometimes we are we are called to control without having any prior assessment how do you proceed for this case we will like to have the uh, for prompt history from the patient's relative because patient is already in and we are being called from outside most of the times we are in a standby what's called a standby anesthesia so monitor anesthesia care we need to have all the uh, general precautions which will be taking for a general anesthesia patient so for a mac and a general anesthesia it's almost the same thing which will be proceeding so if they are calling us urgently so we'll have a quick uh, uh, briefing from the patient's relative about his history about his drugs and uh, his npo status first of all so after that we will move on if needed to give a, a anxiolytic sedation in the form of a midazolam uh, and uh, some analgesic in the form of tramadol if indicated and uh, if required a texmed or uh, in a so titrated doses as well as a propofol in titrated doses if needed if his airway is secure is if his airway is uh, uh, normal shall i add something this is all this is all we can do apart from giving uh, some analgesic uh, a fentanyl or if indicated this is what we can do at the last moment uh, dr vendra shall i add something here the question yes, was sir. regarding the higher bp in the ot na 
Yes, so, sir. Uh, history is always important. Actually, uh, that's in the beginning I told, many times the patient is on the table and we are called for, for the sudden crisis in yes. the thermic ordinance. And while dealing with such patients, uh, I think before resorting to dexmedidomidine, I think we may not be having any, uh, you know, cardiac history or something. We have not seen exactly. the like, yes. ECG, sometimes ECG is also not done because the exactly. dexmedidomidine is also contraindicated in your conduction, fibers, disturbances. So it is not always advisable to switch out to the dextomid immediately. Sedation is fine. And regarding the antihepatense, if you want to switch over to whatever is available here, I think many times you have got that uh, propranolol available with you there. Esmolol is there. But before proceeding, I think a clinical short, quick clinical examination of the patient is very important. Keep an auscultation of the chest. Suppose a spasm should not be there. And even if you want to proceed, because these patients, if they have higher BP, they are living with that BP for a long time. It's not that suddenly they have developed a higher blood pressure. And their threshold is such that sudden drop of the blood pressure may be very harmful for them. It's always better exactly. to get, uh, slowly because sudden BP, uh, I don't know, think so that it will be causing a disturbance in the ophthalmic surgery. Rather, we proceed a very small, uh, slow phase manner that the BP should be brought to whatever the normal limits but above normal yes i know that's the but i think the midazolam is the ram one for every type of these things <laughs> the midazolam but <laughs> in the that, middle of the surgery yes that is why we have to manage it in that way otherwise we'll go with all the techniques and preoperative assessment optimization as per the general anesthesia techniques only yeah, yeah, same time uh, keeping the you know very vigil on the airway also in these type of patients they can suddenly yeah. go uh, suddenly can they you know collapse with the respiratory uh -huh. type uh -huh. of Depression, yes. acute depression also. Yes, sir. Ma'am, we have other query. Uh, what are the alarm signs to stop the surgery uh, on a patient under under a MAC procedure? What is the question, Fazal? Didn't get. Uh, sir, what are, what are the alarms alarm signs to stop the surgery <laughs> for a patient undergoing a procedure under monitored anesthesia care? Either desaturation or hypoxia or any other uh, situation in the vitals. Um, uh, one more question was, uh, what are the guidelines for the stopping of antiplatelets in a patient, in a geriatric patient? Well, for uh, five to seven days, aspirin, you need not stop it. Ticlopidin and uh, the other ones. Uh, they are all according to the AHA guidelines, uh, anticoagulant guidelines, therapies. It also depends upon the type of surgery you are undertaking. Yes. If you are going to for the posterior chamber like surgery. This is a minor, yes, minor uh, surgery. Posterior chamber surgery, you have to be resorting to the guidelines according to a major surgery. But if you are going for anterior chamber, I don't think so. The much bleeding is there. For and you can always go through, you go through even for the three-day stopping of the clobidogrel, which is fast moving towards the different tracking. The old right. guidelines are evolving, shifting to some newer methodology depending on the evidence base, you know, the results. So people are moving toward three to four days of clopidogrel stoppage also. Yes, checking the INR sooner. Yes, uh, one last question was one. Uh, what is the role of preoperative uh, clonidine in a hypertensive phase? Preoperative clonidin. So we are not using it. Uh, I will tell this thing, ma'am. We have done a research on this thing also. We had published a paper long back in 2012, uh, basically okay. about the clonidine use of clonidine in the ophthalmic surgeries. It is very good if you compare it with other drugs. But in this particular patients, why we require clonidine? Because in the many patients of ophthalmic surgery, you keep having irritations post-operatively. And whatever the analgesic the ophthalmologists are using to enhance those effects, the clonidine was very successful in enhancing the duration of analgesia used by the ophthalmologist. But ideally, using the clonidine in a hypertensive patient is of always a challenging nature because, more importantly, the primary drugs, the first-line drugs should be used to control the hypertension rather than going for the third line. Clonidine is the third line of drug for control of hypertension. But... Only when you are going for the blocks, 
it really helped in the promotion of the block. Uh, anticipating a long ophthalmic procedure, definitely the clonidine in the local anesthetic solution is definitely yeah. going to prolong the block in those patients. Okay, sir. Uh, that was the last question. So now, I, think... I, I will ask Aditya one question. Aditya, you had a geriatric patient now. Uh, you had a first slide that was about the chronological age of the geriatric patients, where we consider this is the definition of defining the geriatric, old, very old, whatever. But in a lighter mood, if you say somebody uh, 65 years old, he will say this. <laughs> Opposite dialogue, na? he will say something back to you. So, what I want to presume here is that since our medicines, anesthesiology, sciences, everything is getting advanced, I don't think so. We can label a 65 year old a geriatric patient because now the different parameters has to be brought to define these type of uh, range. A person having a 40 years old patient, maybe having a diabetic, maybe having something, you know, comorbidities. And a 65-year-old running athlete is much, much fitter than 40-year-old. So whatever the precaution you are using for the 65-year-old, you may not be using for the 40-year-old. You think that patient is safe because it is young in age. It's not like that. It is always the physiology of the patient also that should be taken into account to define the geriatric physiological parameters. These parameters are still missing in all the guidelines throughout the world. Now, the time has come to Think over every guideline which has been, you know, formulated earlier for the benefit of the patient, safety of the patient. But with the new, you know, the diagnostic technologies, the diagnostic interventions, the patients are getting treated, the patients are healthy, the awareness about the health, so many things are there. The patients are living longer, the longevity is increased, and the physiological parameters are also improved a lot. So defining a this one, I think this requires a revision. This requires a reconsideration about the chronological age or the physiological age or the clinical age. So these things yeah. will be redefined as the, I think, the, for the terming the patient as a geriatric. Sure, sir. Yes, sir. This is my point of view. Uh, many people may not agree with me, but this is what I think. I think uh, 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 people yeah, are. Uh, yeah. this. <laughs> Dr. Madri want to say something. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Dr. Uh, Tessie. Yes, Dr. Tessie. Uh, if you, uh, regarding the oculocardiac reflex, um, which is better, atropine or glycopyrrolate for prevention? Ma'am, uh, if the patient is a cardiac patient or congenital cardiac disease or any coronary artery disease patient is there, I would go with the... Um, uh, uh, glycoparolate, ma'am. Atropin will have a sudden increase in tachy, sudden increase in heart rate, and they can go into congestive right. cardiac failure. Right. No, no, so just tell me now. Will the glycoparolate will reverse the this one uh, motor reflex, the efferent pathway? Because see, the you have, must have read in your physiology and uh, pharmacology about the quaternary ammonium compounds that do not cross the blood brain barrier. How do you expect yeah. a glycoparolate to affect? Effectively, uh, act effectively in those cases. So, atropine is the answer. Atropine, we have to give. Only atropine. The drug of choice would be atropine. I think, Jesse, no. you No, it. but both have been found to prevent the oculocardiac reflex, and you can use it to treat the oculocardiac. The glycopyrrolate will not affect the senses. This one, the efferent pathway from the your right from the motor cortex. No, it will not cross there. But the peripheral, it do act, but not at the base of the, not at the nucleus level, not at the nucleus level of the brain. And in textbook also, if you go by textbook also, I think atropin is not about a cardiac patient. We are already losing the patient here. We are already losing a patient. So it's better to have a stable cardiac rhythm here. At least. Yeah, definitely. Better. Okay. Uh, what is the uh, you know um, the role of dexmed atomidine? You said no in strabismus surgery. Who presented uh, the strabismus yes. surgery? Yes. No. 
yeah dr tessie uh, so uh, what are the uh, what are, what are the possible post operative problems after strabismus surgery uh, and how to prevent them and how uh, to prevent them they are more prone for post operative nausea vomiting yeah uh, and it, it can that's why we are intraoperatively we are giving dexmedetomidin uh, dexomethasone and we are giving uh, iv onset and at the time of extubation now combination yeah. of these to prevent a post operatively nausea vomiting okay. and we will delay the fluid intake uh, uh, until the post operatively nausea vomiting clears now. okay and will can you have a problem post operatively there will be uh, pain okay. post operative pain yeah pain management we have already covered right anything else so see after strabismus surgery post operative delirium is a very well known complication so much so that in small children they very often become so delirious that they may even pull out their iv lines and scratch their eyes and remove the dressings and so on okay and uh, because we often use sevoflurane for induction in these it's children not yes no. And it is very often known to occur after squint surgery, strabismus surgery. So yeah. what would be the ways to prevent this uh, post-operative delirium? This can happen so both way, in adults and children. Both. Yeah. So one way we can prevent is, ma'am, we can uh, go with a TIVA, uh, total intravenous anesthesia yes. with propofol. That would be a better option. Propofol and nowadays even you can add remifentanil with that. Remifentanil too. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then we can give fentanyl, uh, can give alpha to agonist. Uh, yes, dexmedetomidine. So you were talking about dexmedetomidine. So there is, there is, uh, there, the even meta analysis have systematic reviews and meta analysis have shown that dexmedetomidine reduces the uh, post operative delirium. Then, as you said, you already said it reduces post operative nausea vomiting. Then it reduces the dose of opioids or whatever you know. It produces good, gives good post operative analgesia. And it reduces uh, intraoperatively, of course, the oculocardiac reflex is uh, it brings down. But tell me one thing: dexmedetomidine is known to cause bradycardia. Then how is it that it? How is it that it is said to uh, um, reduce the oculocardiac reflex? Um, these are two contradictory things, no? Yes, ma'am. Hmm. Uh, when compared to we have got a target heart rate. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, dose dependent, ma'am. It's uh, radicardia and hypotension is uh, less when compared to clonidine, uh, dexmedetomidine. No, we are been... not comparing clonidine with dexmedetomidine. We are just trying to find out whether dexmed augments the oculocardiac reflex or it decreases it. It is known to cause bradycardia, right? Yes, ma'am. Then it should uh, increase, uh, it should uh, augment no? the oculocardia. There's a mechanical bradycardia. Go to problem. the mechanism of action of dexmedetomine, you will get the answer. And also go to the. It's very simple. Hmm. It so will decrease the incidence of oculocardiac reflex because of its action only. Huh. The bradycardia and hypotension are the part of its action, but similarly, the nerve huh. conduction. Just, yeah. Okay, that is also part of it. So, if you go by the mechanism of action, you will get the answer. Yes. But still, evidence has to build up on the use of Dexmed for oculocardiac reflex. PG, okay? evidence can't build up. Evidence to assert it. I mean, before it comes in the textbook. <laughs> when they come to the AP level, then they will build yeah. evidence. No, before it comes it. to the textbook, it's not mentioned in the textbook. Anyone else? I think there are so many people, senior people are there. Dr. Lalit sir, you are mute. Do you have any questions? Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Your question is always there, Mishan. Yes, absolutely. Your question will always be there, right? Yeah, yeah. They had yes. given all the questions. One question is that we cannot give block in the pediatric patient. But my surgeon has done all these surgery, cataract surgery with block. I have to use to give ketamine and they give under sedation the block and the surgery can be completed. 
with the expert hands and the volume has to be decreased. That is the first requirement, sir. For the block in a pediatric patient, your surgeon has to be very, very competent. Provided your NSAT is also competent, both are competent. You can give a very effective block in the pediatric patient, which can have a long-lasting effect on the post of rehabilitation and recovery of such patients. We are regularly doing it, sir. In eye surgery, we are doing it. It's, it's yeah. always, uh, even when the neonates, we are talking about the neonates, they're very, very effective. Small blocks, but under sedation. And the only yeah. thing is that whether you secure the airway with a small LMA or just with a small mask or chin-up or with a prong, the, uh, there are so many methods. This is individual to individual basis. We can avoid the adverse effect with the GA and yeah, reticulum. No doubt about that, sir. The patient, More, uh, it can be good. Periphery district level. Yeah, because sir, premature babies are there. The, I think many premature retinopathy or prematurity babies come to us and it's very difficult to, you know, give them G and bring them out. So it's yes, better to go for such patients, uh, you know, a little deep sedation monitoring the, uh, this one parameters or you can have a small LMA, something like that. Na? It's a very difficult uh, to man manage such patients. But here comes the role of the good ophthalmologist. Yeah. Very effective in block. Your doses reduces like anything. You don't have to give much sedation and uh, anesthesia. And regarding the antiplatelets, these patients, nowadays the phaco surgery is done under tropical anesthesia. And you are hmm. right, sir. They are just giving one or two days stoppage of that drug and they are able to do that surgery because of less bleeding is there. Yeah, sir, our country is the best country to give the data because yes. maximum procedures are performed in our country. You go by the any medical college, the camps are there. Suddenly in the camps, 50 to 100 patients come for a day. In the, Four or five surgeons work in continuity. You complete the all the 100 cases in one day and you won't see a single complication in these cases. Yes, and many of them many of them are already on the, you know, sir, anticoagulant. Many of them, they will not give history. They are just mobilized from the camp by the social workers. Nobody takes a history. They just come one, one go, one go, come, go, come, go like that. You don't see any type of complication in these type of patients. And to the youngest, if they had given block and they feel the globe is tight, not to worry. They have to lift it, give a padding and dressing and postpone the case. I had faced two cases and later on after a week, we further proceed for the surgery. Yes, sir, sir. Pearl of wisdom also. Dr. Vaishnav sir is also there. He is the, one of the uh, stalwart, the most yeah, senior. And and yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> sir, your word yes. of wisdom. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, this is my day to day practice cataract, uh, cataract surgery under peribulbar block. I give the block and midas, uh, my practice is just midazolam and uh, peribulbar block. That's all. Lakh dukho ki ek dawa. As you say, as you say. That's good, sir. I think that is a real thing. And uh, uh, we Indians are giving anesthesia in remote locations, in a peripheral location with minimal resources to the maximum patients. Whatever the learning curve we have achieved over the years is much, much better than that curve achieved by the people from the Western countries. They may be having all the infrastructures, having all the, you know, the most important part, uh, the facilities, every, everything is there. But ultimately, it is the patient, how you treat your patient and, uh, you know, the way we are dealing with the patient every day, there is a chance of a patient getting violent, patient getting any complication happening to the patient, they are on, on you. So we are giving anesthesia in such a challenging situation and we are very, very safely giving it. And with the whatever monitoring we have got, whatever resources we are have, we are having at our disposal. I think that itself is a big chapter in any book. If you're going to write, a, you know, anesthesia for an Indian scenario, it's going to be a great book and it can beat any book in the world because the situation you have received, the situation you have achieved, the circumstances you face, they are not comparable to the Western world, but the results are much, much beyond them. This I can assure. So uh, I think every country has got advantage. Professor, thank you. 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 Anybody else want to um, share? One more question in chat box. 
yeah please use of psg guided in uh, for blocks ultrasound guided blocks ultrasound guided i think somebody from the regional anesthesia i am i'm not uh, not yeah, we are also not using sir i'm not i'm not used to ultrasound and the yes, people the probes will be needed for that special probes for uh, ophthalmic yes, PNDT request for the ophthalmic OT for the USG is also a big uh, headache. So we are not using USG. Madam, we are not getting ultrasound for even the general blocks. How can we go we for We don't have either. We are also not. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, the younger generation is very, very adept in this uh, situation. They are using ultrasound everywhere. And I think soon they will come out another three, four years. You will see they go by the side of the eye. They will see which structure they are piercing. They will be very much proficient in the retrobulbar, peribulbar. I think uh, you have given a food for thought to all those people who are practicing the ultrasound guided regional blocks. And soon they will be coming up with a new research studies that how much it really helped in achieving those perfect blocks with the help of ultrasound the OT. I think that can go, that can come up. We haven't seen the articles also being published in those areas. So, or somebody just putting on the eye, I think that is another area we can have. Dr. Madhuri want to add to this thing. Ultrasound guided retrobulbar blocks. There are studies. Indian studies. No, no, not Indian studies. <laughs> I'm talking about Indian studies. No, we have to start the Indian studies here, the search. No, I don't know about that, this thing, but there are studies uh, on retro. But as you told, it is in the... Uh, definitely evidence is building up. Infant, stage, infant up. stage. Yes. I think Dr. Naresh Paliwal has also added something that they have used Dexcat and blocks for some cases. Maybe he wants to add. He wants He's to there. Dr. Naresh, are you there? You can come up yes, with your word of wisdom. Dr. Naresh Paliwal, sir. Hello. Yeah, audible. Hello. Uh, has anyone used Dexcat as a sedation in pediatric cases? Combination of dexmedetomidine and ketamine. We have used, but not frequently. Occasionally, occasionally we have used. Not I have stopped using any other sedation for pediatric patients. For any pediatric patient, right from neonet to neonate, so very good. It maintains the tone and integrity of the airway. And also in difficult airway situations, it does not hamper the airway tone. So the saturation and everything is maintained. I used it uh, even in cases of uh, difficult intubations for inducing the patients with Dexcat and CO induction, tidal induction with CO for intubation. For uh, IOL procedures, I have done more than 100, 200 cases of IOL, pediatric IOLs with Dexcat and blocks. It's just like natural sleep. The baby sleeps just like natural sleep for uh, half an hour to one hour. And then no nausea vomiting, nothing else. They ta take care of the disadvantages of each other, ketamine and dexmit. So it's a very good sedation. There are many reports and I have also published some case reports about that. So just we, can uh, try this. Uh, Dr. Nish, we used dexmitoin and ketamine in 2012 and 13 also. Yeah, I am using in since but last thing. After years. you know what happened? We stopped using in our institution because ophthalmologists themselves started using dexamidine without even informing the anesthesiologist. <laughs> they are putting every patient on the dexamidine. They put an infusion in yes. the 500 ml saline bottle and they started. And mm. they always call, I think, hardly they call. With this drug, they are feeling so safe. But, you know, if you go and tell them, I think the relations get sore uh, also. Let so them no use that. <laughs> but whenever they get a problem, then they will always call you. Yeah, but, uh, this automatic. is a very good and very safe sedation for pediatric patients. Uh, definitely, I agree with that. Definitely. I have used it even in Ludwig's angina, neck abscesses and everything. Just Dexcat and give whatever blocks, either spinal, epidural, caudal, anything. It's a very good it's sedation. In 90s. In 90s, our pediatric surgeons started using ketamine day, uh, day in, day out uh, from our practice, and we had to stop them. Just putting it's a, you know, a very good uh, uh, opioid sparing effect, also. It takes care for post op analgesia for almost 24 hours. The Dex only disadvantage is it does not non, have an amnesic effect. Dexmedivine known to decrease the hallucination of ketamine, also. Yeah. Every every side effect of ketamine is countered by dexmit and ketamine takes care of dexmit side effects and dexmit takes care of the ketamine side effects. And also the uh, onset is uh, delayed onset of dexmit 
is hassan by ketamine when you mix them together so it's very good can be used intranasally can be used sub uh, this thing iv intramuscular and now even subcutaneously also they have tried Sir, so dose sorry. combination of dexkit. Uh, I generally use 0.5 mcg per kg dexmet and 1 milligram per kg ketamine. Mix it together, dilute it slightly and give as a bolus over a minute till the baby is like sedated and not responding. You don't need anything, not even oxygen. We keep oxygen nasal prongs, but that is also not needed with this much. If you don't give anything else. Anybody else? Or now I think it's 8.15. These are good cases. So I think they should, uh, Aditya and uh, Tessie should be awarded something. Na? Better to give them some awards. But I think the teacher did a wonderful job. So, so thank you to give us such an opportunity to present in the national platform. Yeah. Am I, am I screen visible to you, ma'am? Yes, sir. So, ma'am, your name is visible? Yes, sir. Thank you. So, it's a felicitation from ISA national side, from the national ISA represented by me, I then Dr. Madhuri, Dr. Dr. Nishan, Dr. Pridima, all are representing the national ISA here. So, it is a token of appreciation. Then Dr. Jigisha Badekha, you. madam. Thank you, ISA Thank National. You, sir, uh, <laughs> sir can you make a certificate from the mail? Yeah, everything, all the certificates will be sent by mail also, but it is a, on the online. We are felicitating you, Dr. Brinda also. And Thank all you, the sir, teachers did a wonderful job in preparing the Dr. Aditya and Dr. Teshijo. So really a good presentation. And uh, I think they were, must be doing good in the department also. And we wish yes, them, yes. Both are very good. We wish them uh, good luck for their upcoming examination also later this year. Thank and Fazal, it was a debut for Fazal as well as for uh, Gayatri. And uh, both did a wonderful job without any hesitation, without any hitch. So it's a great job by both of them. They will be keep coming on the national platform whenever they will be given an opportunity in the future also. So, wonderful job. So thank, thank you all. Thank you. And thank uh, you, the more important thanks to Dr. Madhuri because she always takes care of these type of uh, preparation. People may be thinking that these are classes are just going on, but uh, hard work goes in the preparing. And uh, in the nights also, you wake up and get up the preparation mm -hmm. mode. The Fazal and Gayatri knows it much better than me. Yes. Than Dr. Nishant and Dr. Ridhima, they are always there. So for preparing our classes and uh, really thank to them. So, uh, if uh, anybody has to say anything, then we can close these classes from here. Anybody? Last minute. Last sir, two minutes. Nowadays, sir, nowadays we have started study on oral uh, dexmedromidin syrup. I mean, we are keeping in the syrup and we are giving for solution. Is it sweet so or we... sour? The mm -hmm. syrup is sweet or sour? Sweet, sweet. So, and uh, be careful, somebody may not drink the entire bottle also. Freshly prepared, we'll keep it and we'll give. Okay, the results okay. of intranasal are better than your oral. So try it intranasally. Okay. okay so we'll With automizer, you can have Dexcat as a sedation just 15 okay. minutes before. I had wonderful uh, results. Sublingually, it is, though it is uh, absorbed more, but the effectiveness is more of intranasal. Because of that, okay. the first part. There are many studies uh, about this. Pass, bypass metabolism is avoided because of the direct going to the. Uh, there are many studies about this. You can go. No, 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 no. Na yeah. Nasal sublingual are always better routes. But I think if, if somebody has to give me pre medication, I will prefer the oral. Yes, sir, sir, sir. You, can, you, of can even, you can even use nebulized to text matter now. The same thing. Same yeah. thing, intranasal or nebulized dexmedromidine. I think the solutions will come in the coming years where the, uh, I think, even the, you will have a different formulation for the intravenous, intramuscular, and the nasal and oral also preparation. You will have a different formulation very soon. Stability according to the temperature, enzymes available, or whatever the catabolic uh, hormones available in different routes, you will get dexmedromidine in those preparatory formulations also in the coming days.
Anybody else? Or we shall say it a good night now. Good night. Good night, sir. Yeah. Good night, sir. Thank you very so, much. Thank you. Again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. I think a wonderful thank job you. done today. And we will meet next week again. Till then. Till then, it's a good night.